Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. My message is, is entitled, The King of Kings. A couple weeks ago, we covered discerning political issues with a biblical lens. And we learned that the political issues that we're experiencing are actually moral issues that the Bible addresses. And that what we see is actually moral, sinful dilemmas in our society. And that the whole earth is actually groaning for the Savior to come back. The whole earth is groaning for his return to make all things right. And my friends, I just want to let you know, he is coming back. That is his next promise. And so what we see, what we try to make, uh, what, what the world has made political, God has already been talking about that morally and sinfully for a long time. It's biblical issues. And so we just covered a little bit of that and, uh, and covered over just how we can approach that by being a salt and light in our community, by preaching the gospel and helping preserve godliness in our nation. We really said this, that we need God back in government. And we learned that last week too, that the role of government is for its servants, for the elected officials to actually serve God in government, to actually render God's righteousness and justice in the land. And today I just wanna remind us who's on the throne. That no matter what happens this week, we know this, Jesus is on the throne and he rules and reigns. And I realize that elections do have, we all know this, elections do have consequences on nations, don't they? They do. And so we've been praying and we've been seeking the Lord. We've been doing our study. We've been looking at the candidates' positions and things. Now, hopefully you've done that. I know I have done that. And I pray continuously and not just on the national level, but here in our local government. Amen. It's so important that we understand who is going to be representing us in government. But in the end, I wanna give you three things today to keep in your heart and mind this week. Number one, God is supreme over all. Number two, God is sovereign, which means he still governs over all things. Even though things happen, God still governs over all those things. And number three, God is savior and he will save us no matter what happens. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. But you know I need to preach that, right? So we can't go home now. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter two. I think Pastor Jonathan Quattel did an excellent job educating us last week. And he used this verse in Daniel two. And so I wanna give us context to it. Daniel chapter two, it's in the Old Testament. If you run into the book of Ezekiel, go to the end of that and you will find Daniel. And the context we have here is God's people ignored the prophetic warnings of Jeremiah and continued in their idol worship and disobedience to God. And because of this disobedience to God, his people, the consequence of their sin was God sending King Nebuchadnezzar to besiege Jerusalem and exile the people from their land. And through this exile, God intended his people to reflect on their sinful ways and be humbled and repent for what they've done. But even in God's judgment, even in the consequence they have to endure, God continued to preserve and protect his people. And I think we may not realize that, that even sometimes when God judges us and gives us a consequence, that he's still there waiting for us to repent and come back to him. And God never turned his back on the covenant he made with his people. And that covenant was that through him would be a great king that would come. And we all know his name is Jesus Christ. So God was preserving his people even in a land, a foreign land. And among those taken captive were four wise men whom we hear about in the book of Daniel. And that's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And God would elevate them into government positions in Babylon. And there came a night where King Nebuchadnezzar had an impossible request. And so let's get into that scripture tonight or today. 
Daniel chapter two, verse one. One night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I've had a dream, and so it's a singular dream that keeps happening again and again, that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, long live the king. Tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. Makes sense, right? But the king said to the astrologers, I am serious about this. If you don't tell me what my dream was and what it means, you'll be torn limb from limb and your houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. Wow. But if you tell me what I dreamed and what the dream means, I will give you many wonderful gifts and honors. Just tell me the dream and what it means. Now, we all know this is like impossible, right? From the human perspective, from, from man's perspective, this is impossible. Don't just tell me what the dream meant. Tell me what I actually dreamed and then interpret it for me. Well, they're, they're saying the obvious, that that's impossible. They said, please, your, ma your majesty, verse seven, tell us a dream and we will tell you what it means. And the king replied, I know what you're doing. You're stalling for time because you know I am serious when I say, if you don't tell me the dream, you're doomed. So you have conspired to tell me lies, hoping I would change my mind, but tell me the dream and then I'll know that you can tell me what it means. The astrologers replied to the king, no one on earth can tell the king his dream and no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter or astrologer. The king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream and they do not live here among people. The king was furious and when he heard this, uh, when he heard this, and he ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be executed. And because of the king's decree, men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them, Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. He asked Arioch, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? And it is harsh, isn't it? So Arioch told him all that had happened. Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. That, that's brave, by the way. Because first you handle the commander eloquently and carefully, but now you're gonna go before the man who wants you dead. Then Daniel went home and told his friends, so he got, he, he got permission. Uh, he went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah what had happened. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He, he urged them to ask the God of heaven, uh, just real quick context, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar changes their names because he wants them to identify with his culture and get them to completely turn on God. So by doing that, he even changed their names and the meanings of their names. So verse 18 says, he urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. That night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised God of heaven and he said, praise the name of God forever and ever for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. Are you seeing this? Look, I have a lot of scripture today and the scripture speaks for itself. You don't need my words, you need the word of God. And I pray today you will be, you will be um, comforted that you will leave here with confidence that God is overseeing this nation and the world, not just our nation. And he's taking care of things, amen. amen. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. He reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what lies hidden in darkness, though he is surrounded by light. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors, for you have given me wisdom and strength. You have told me what we asked of you and revealed to us what the king demanded. Praise the Lord. I do think before I move forward, I should say there is power in praying together. He gathered his friends and they sought the Lord and he answered. And God gave him what he needed. God tells him what the dream is, shows him what the dream is, 
And then Daniel knows the interpretation of the dream. That's the God we serve. That's the God who is supreme over all. Verse 24 says this, then Daniel went in to see Arioch, whom the king had ordered to execute the wise men of Babylon. Daniel said to him, don't kill the wise men, take me to the king and I will tell him the meaning of his dream. Did you notice that? He said, don't kill the wise men. Now Daniel is being there for those who are pagan, practicing witchcraft. That's showing mercy, isn't it? Verse 25 says, Arioch quickly took Daniel to the king and said, I have found one of the captives from Judah who would tell the king the meaning of his dream. The king said to Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? And Daniel replied, what powerful words this is. There are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. There is no man that can do this, but there is a God. The one who's supreme over all. And he begins to tell him what he dreamed. While you were, your majesty was sleeping, you dreamed about coming events. He who reveals secrets has shown you what is going to happen. It is not because I am wiser than anyone else that I know the secret of your dream, but because God wants you to understand what was in your heart. In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze. Its legs were iron and its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. As you watched, a rock was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing them to bits. The whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace, like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. That was the dream. Now we would tell you, we will tell the king what it means. Your majesty, you are the greatest of kings. The God of heaven has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. He has made you the ruler over all the inhabited world and has put you, or put even uh, the wild animals and birds under your control. You are the head of gold. So King Nebuchadnezzar represents the head of gold in this dream. But after your kingdom comes to an end, another kingdom inferior to yours, will rise to take your place. After that kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom, represented by bronze, will rise to rule the world. Following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one, as strong as iron, that that kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires, just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes. The feet and toes you saw were a combination of iron and baked clay, showing that his kingdom will be divided Like iron mixed with clay, it will have some of the strength of iron, but while some parts of it will be as strong as iron, other parts will be as weak as clay. This mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other through intermarriage, but they will not hold together just as iron and clay do not mix. He's referring to many different nations coming together and uh, being married together. During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness and it will stand forever. Did you notice that? It says this, during the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness and it will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain though not by human hands that crushed to pieces the statue of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true and its meaning is certain. Let me give to you real quick here, what is that that dream? What are the, the different body parts of the dream? Who are they? We know that first of all, the head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian empire. The chest and arms of silver represented the Medes and the Persians who defeated the Babylonians in 539 BC. But after them was the belly and thighs of bronze represented the Grecian Empire, Greece, 
between 334 to 330 BC by Alexander the Great. So they came in and defeated the Persians. But then the greatest, most powerful force of all was the Romans. The legs of iron and clay represent the Roman Empire, which defeated the Greeks in 63 BC. So this is a prophetic message from God. And then there was one more kingdom that came after this. And it was the kingdom that God was setting up. And it's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Now, it's interesting that it says iron and clay was the legs and the feet of the Roman Empire. There was a lot of division and they could never mix. If you heat the two together, they don't stick together. There was so much division in the Roman Empire that it fell apart. At the same time, Christianity exploded in the book of Acts. We read all about that. In the first 300 years, Christianity took off and exploded and spread across the world. And then we see the demise of the Roman Empire. Nebuchadnezzar had seen a rock hit and smash the image. The statue was destroyed by the rock, not by human hands. In scripture, a rock often refers to Jesus Christ, Israel's Messiah. God who had enthroned Nebuchadnezzar and would transfer authority from Babylon to Medo-Persia, then to Greece, ultimately to Rome, will one day invest political power in a king who will rule over the earth subduing it to his authority, thus culminating God's original destiny for man. What's what's being talked about here is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. This smiting rock became a mountain and mountains in the Bible represent kingdoms. And this kingdom continued to grow and grow and grow and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When Jesus comes, he will establish the Messianic kingdom promised to Israel through David. At his return, he will subjugate all kingdoms to himself, thus bringing them to an end. Then he will rule forever in the millennium and in the eternal state. What Daniel was prophesying wasn't just what's gonna happen in the next 500 some years. He was prophesying what would happen in the end days that we are living in today. The next kingdom to rule and reign them all is actually the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's powerful. He is the king of kings, amen? Amen. Verse 46 says, then King Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel and worshiped him. And he commanded his people to offer sacrifices and burn sweet incense before him. The king said to Daniel, truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. Look at that, he's now worshiping God. He's proclaiming God is the greatest. Then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon. Did we realize that just not so long ago he was kidnapped? (laughs) from Jerusalem, (laughs) and now he is in second in command. It's, It's incredible. At Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of all the affairs of the province of Babylon, while Daniel remained in the king's court. Only God can do something like that. Amen. I want to give us basically three reminders, but I have four points to give it to help us with that. But Three reminders about God this election season, but I, I do want you to apply this to anything in your life. So let's not make it just about Tuesday in this election or this week. Let's make it about everything. Perhaps you're going through something in your life where you need God to answer or you're not sure what God is up to. Welcome to the family. We're all still trying to figure God out at times and how he works. I just want to say this too. When we can't figure God out, what we can know is he is faithful. When we can't figure God out, what we can know is he is good. And he's looking out for your best. He's looking out most of all though for his will to be done. Even more than your best. God's will supersedes my will, amen? God's will supersedes your will. So what you think is your will for your life, God might say, well, that's not exactly my will for your life. 
Maybe you're going through a situation with your marriage. Maybe family. Maybe you've been praying for God to save a family member or a loved one. Maybe you're questioning things about work. What is God's will? Well, I pray today as we apply these these points, as we look at these points and seek to apply them to our lives, that you will be encouraged. And I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture because I want scripture to speak for itself. Sound good? So our first reminder, number one, is God is above all. You know why? God is supreme. God is above all powers, all gods, all kings in the earth. If you have your Bibles as well, you can go to Isaiah 40. You're going to turn backwards towards the front of your Bible, the prophet Isaiah gives a beautiful explanation, a prophetic word to the people of God at that time. And it's titled in my Bible, the Lord has no equal. Isaiah 40 verse 12, it'll be on the screen for you as well. And just marvel in the supremacy of God. May it humble us today too, remembering that we're just like a little grasshopper or a little ant on this planet compared to him. The Lord has no equal. Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, just so you know. Who is able to advise the spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good? Did someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? No. For all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. All the nations, not one. All the nations are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. Picture that for a moment. All the wood in Lebanon's forest and all Lebanon's animals would not be enough to make a burnt offering worthy of our God. The nations of the world are worth nothing to him. In his eyes, they count for less than nothing, mere emptiness and froth. To whom can you compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? Can he be compared to an idol formed in a mold, overlaid with gold and decorated with silver chains? By the way, this is what they did a lot. They created these idols thinking that it would even come close to being like God. Or if people are too poor for that, they might at least choose wood that won't decay and a skilled craftsman to carve an image that won't fall down. Haven't you heard? Don't you understand? Are you deaf to the words of God, the words he gave before the world began? Are you so ignorant? God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below seem like grasshoppers to him. He spreads out the heavens like a curtain and makes his tent from them. He judges the great people of the world. He brings them all to nothing. They hardly get started, barely taking root when he blows on them and they wither. The wind carries them off like chaff. You know, he's an eternal God. So our lives are like a blip or just a mist, and that's it. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal, asked the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Oh, Jacob, How can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Maybe you need to put your name there. Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Maybe I need to put my name there. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. 
They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. There are no equal. There is no equal to God. God reigns in supreme over all. My second reminder is God is sovereign over all. And I'm just praying that these scriptures are edifying your heart today and giving you strength today and confidence in him. God is sovereign over all, which means God governs over all things and what he wills or allows will take place, amen? Proverbs 21.1 says this, the king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. The ESV version says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. If needed, God can stir the heart of a king or a leader to change course and accomplish his will. We actually read about that in Ezra 1.1 where God stirs the heart of King Cyrus to send back his people to rebuild the temple after this period that we're reading about in Daniel chapter 2 that God can stir the hearts of evil kings and evil leaders to do his will. That to me brings me comfort that no matter what happens in our season of life, God is sovereign. God governs over all things. God is going to look out for his people. That brings us to our third reminder. God is salvation for all, especially those who trust and follow him. God has offered salvation to all, but only those who trust and follow him will experience the salvation of God. And so if you have a chance here to go to Psalm 33 for me real quick, it's further back in our Bible. Psalm 33, we're gonna start with verse six. God is salvation for all. So he's above all, he's sovereign, he governs over all. And God is salvation for all. He offers it to all people. And he's going to take care of us. In Psalm 33, verse 6 says, The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. Isn't that beautiful? He assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Let the whole world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in all of him. For when he spoke... The world began. That's a biblical worldview of creation. It appeared at his command. The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes. Do we have any idea how much he's protecting us? I mean, we, we really don't know how much. Even the CIA and the FBI have no idea what God is up to. But the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. What joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people he has chosen as his inheritance. And now that we're in the New Testament era, all those who believe in him are the chosen. We have joy because Christ is has us in his hands, amen? Amen. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From his throne, he observes all who live on earth. He made their hearts, so he understands everything they do. The best equipped army cannot save a king, nor is great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on your war horse to give you victory for all its strength, it cannot save you. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Amen. Amen. Beautiful, right? Now turn over to Psalm 146. In in case anyone ever said, Calvary doesn't teach from the Bible. (laughs) Someone share this video with them. I've been accused of that. 
Isn't that interesting? Our church has been accused of not teaching from the Bible. All right. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. Let's say that together. Praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. All right, I'll read from here. (laughs) I will praise the Lord as long as I live. Mm. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth and all their plans die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He keeps every promise forever. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and widows, but he frustrates the plans of the wicked. See, God cares about all people. The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God. O Jerusalem, throughout the generations, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. God protects, God provides, God preserves the godly. Those who fear and love him, he takes care of them. God watched over Daniel and his friends, but God's a merciful God too, because not only was Daniel spared and his friends spared, but so were all of the other astrologers and magicians that were there. They were going to die, but they were spared, how? through the righteousness of God working through the people of God. I preached a couple weeks ago that we help preserve. We are the salt and light. It is through our, our relationship with the Lord. But don't get this wrong. Obviously, God gets all the glory. But God has asked us to be his ambassadors here on earth to represent him. And through our example, people will come to glorify God. That's what Matthew talks about, Matthew 5, about being the salt and light. And so because of our obedience to the Lord, our trust in the Lord, people all around us will be blessed. They will experience the righteousness of God, the justice of God. And so we want to live that way. And I just want to encourage you with this scripture that God protects, provides, and preserves. He has done that. Look at, look at the last four years. Look at the last eight years. Look at the last 12 years. Look at the last 16 years. God is faithful. Yes, terrible things have happened. People have been hurt. There have been consequences to things. But in the end, God is still on the throne. And we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Amen. Why? Because God preserves his people. He protects for them. He provides for them. Romans 8, 28. We learned about the groanings for Jesus to come back and for all things to be restored. But this is later on in Romans 8. We learned that two weeks ago in Romans 8, but later on in that chapter, it says this, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Those who love God and are called according to the purpose for them. What is God's will now then? Let me, let me share something with you. If If Daniel's prophecy has come true now, partly, but not in full, the kingdom of of Jesus Christ has begun, amen? And we are part of that kingdom here on earth. So it has begun, but it's not over yet because Jesus must come back. And so that's the next part of the fulfillment of that prophecy is that Jesus will come back and will reign and rule over all kingdoms and powers and we will all worship him. 
So what are we supposed to do now? Because we're on the subject that God is salvation for all. So what is God's will now? Because God has worked in biblical history to bring us to this moment. So what does he want us to do? My last portion of, a large portion of scripture to read. And then we're going to worship him again in song. Let's go all the way to the New Testament. Second Peter, near the end of your Bible. Second Peter 3, 1 through 15. Second Peter 3, 1 through 15, and it's going to be on the screen for you as well. This is Peter writing to the church, and he says, this is my second letter to you, dear friends, and in both of them I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the holy prophets said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. Sound familiar? They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has re remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. We've heard that multiple times today. And he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood, referring to Noah. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. In other words, he doesn't function on the same time as we do. He's eternal. So what feels like a day for us could be like a thousand for him. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise about returning, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. See, God wants all people to be saved. Amen. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. This is that messianic reign of the king of kings coming. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what should we do? What holy and godly lives you should live. That's the first thing he says. The first thing he says is to make sure we live in holy, pure lives. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth, he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. Church, in other words, it's time for us to help people find Jesus before he comes back. Amen. That's God's will for us now. Why don't we stand together? Well, you can knock off some stuff off your Bible reading plan. We're gonna pray and worship in a moment, but I want us to remember this one verse. The whole chapter is beautiful, but there's so many scriptures I've read so far, but Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. My heart today was that we remind our hearts, our minds, our souls of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And I pray today that you are encouraged. We should do what we need to do. We have every right to go vote. We should pray. We should do everything we can. In the end, it should be God's will. Amen. And so that's what we're going to do. And on Wednesday night, we're going to pray together. And we're going to worship and we're just 
Give God worship and praise no matter what. It's our prayer night. It's our usual one. It, it fell at this time, so we didn't want to make any changes. And so we're going to come together, we're going to pray, and we're going to worship, and we're going to thank God and just give him glory and praise. And I uh, just, just want to encourage you to keep these truths in your heart. God is supreme, God is sovereign, and God is Savior. We're in good hands. Amen. When I was preparing for this message weeks ago, the Lord put the song, All Hail King Jesus, on my heart. And so let's sing this from the depths of our heart today. And then Dorothy's going to come out here and share an important announcement we have for you. So some volunteers may walk out uh, because they're getting ready at their stations. But would you hear out this important announcement we have for you? It's about the Thanksgiving feast. We want you to be aware of that. It's coming up in a few weeks. Isn't that wild? It is Thanksgiving soon. My goodness. So, all right. I'm going to pray here and then we're going to worship. Lord, thank you so much. Lord, we give you this worship. Lord, we're keeping you on the throne of our hearts, keeping you on the throne of our nation and our world. You are over all. And so our hearts should worship you that way. All our hope is in you. And we trust you, God. We will do our part. We will be good stewards, Lord, of our prayers, our vote, this nation, our community. God, we thank you, Lord. You've given us responsibility to care about these things. So, Lord, we pray over what's going to be ready to come, Lord. And for Tuesday and the days after, Lord. Lord, no matter what happens, your will right now is that you are sparing time, you are giving time, you're relenting because you want more people to be saved. So God, help us as a church to remain focused on the mission of preaching the gospel to the nations and see people come to know Christ. Lord, we worship you today in spirit and in truth together as the body of Christ. God, may you be glorified through this song. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.